Hey, how are you? I'm Kevin Kenny. Welcome to a brand new episode of Billboard in Studio. Our guest today, I'm going to say it, a media mogul, Seth MacFarlane. You make me sound like a Murdoch. <laughs> I know. You must be one of the, uh, I, I want, this is a funny title, but one of the quietest media moguls going. I, I saw in an interview recently that Family Guy, not to make you feel uncomfortable here, worth over a billion dollars. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, it's weird. I'm one of those people, I don't, I don't follow the, the numbers of my own stuff as much as I should. I, 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 I'm more about the creative side, but that's good news. Yeah. No, it's, it's, pr it's pretty, uh, pretty incredible when you think about the track record, you know, from film to TV and now music, of course, or really Ben music. I'm late to the Seth MacFarlane music game. You've been doing this since, I guess, 2011. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, I, I did uh, my first record with uh, my composer, Joel McNeely, um, called Music is Better Than Words, and we've done, yeah, we've done four of them. And uh, it's, it's, you know, what, what we do is a very specific thing that's, you know, uses the, the methodology of a very specific time, and, 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 uh, and it's worked out well for us. So did your relationship for, if you're watching right now, you don't know Joel McNeely, he also is the composer, I guess you can say, right, for the Orville. He does the arrangements on the Orville. He does, yeah, he does, he score, he does a lot of scores for American Dad, but he's, he's written some beautiful stuff for the Orville. It's a 75-piece orchestra every week. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a very versatile guy. But that relationship, it started in the world of music, or did it start at American Dad? No, it's it started with American Dad, and um, you know he had done a lot of jazz in his past. He had he had written a lot. He had written some stuff for George Lucas for the Young Indiana Jones TV show back in the '90s, and he'd written a lot of really good jazz for that show. And so I, I tapped him to to arrange some songs for me for for the first album. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about something about that I think is funny about our culture here in America. So we celebrate greatness, right? We want to celebrate, let's say you, right, as this great filmmaker, this person that makes us laugh on television each and every week, right? But then, you know, you see it happen where, whether it's back in the day, Michael Jordan going trying to play baseball and people dogging him, or Kanye thinking he could be a fashion designer, you know? Did you face any skepticism when you started making music coming over from the world of Hollywood? Yeah, I think, I think when you're, it's interesting. There's something about people's, appreciation of the music they like that's particularly passionate even more so than movies or um, you know m music is has more akin it's more akin to sports in a weird way it's like when people people are obsessive about sports teams that they like people are obsessive about musicians that they like so if you come into that world from a different profession it's oftentimes uh, greeted with folded arms and a scowl and you know, I think for that reason, you see a lot of people. You know, you see people like like uh, you know, like Will Smith, who've gone from music to acting and been very successful at it. Um, and the other way around, you, there there really isn't. I can't think of one person. I mean, it's it's a very very it's tough to do. Yeah, it's a very hard thing. So, you know, so here, the the way we go about it is look. You know, the the vocals and what I do is 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 one part of this. I mean, it's, it's, you know, these, these records are really about, it's about as much about the music as it is about, about the vocals. And, and, you know, we, we recorded Abbey Road with usually like a 40 to 50 piece orchestra. And, you know, we showcase great arrangements and great musicians and great players. Um, in addition to the vocals, there's a, you know, there, there was some comment that Sinatra made way back that I always, that I've always kind of embraced. It's like, look, the singer is one quarter of the recording, and you know, it's it's the it's the vocalist, it's the arrangements, it's the the uh, composer, and it's the lyricist. And you're one quarter of that that uh, you know team that that foursome. Form, yeah. And um, and and it's and that and we we do try to embrace that to really make this make this something that feels substantial. Yeah, you touch on the recording process of In Full Swing. By the way, congratulations, two Grammy nominations for In Full Swing. Thank you. Also a number one debut on our traditional jazz chart. Pretty cool. When you talk about these chart successes, actually before I get to the recording process, I want to ask you this question, is that you know, when, you, when you're purely a musician, livelihood really is these charts and the Grammys, right? That's kind of the, the bread and butter of, of success here in the music industry. When you're someone like you who, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be traditionally successful in music. When you approach music, do you think about those things? Do you think about accolades? No, no, I don't. I don't really do that with anything that I do. I mean, I, I, I do. Look, I mean, there, there, there are filmmakers who make films to win Oscars. There are television 
producers who make shows that basically, you know, beg for a Golden Globe or be beg for an Emmy. I, I, I haven't ever worked like that. I do, for me, it's, it's usually about the, you know, the audience, what they want, and, and also what I f what's fun for me, what I feel like is going to be creatively fulfilling. Right. And um, with the music, it's the same thing. Like, we're, we're, I'm just making music that I would want to listen to. Um, I, I love orchestras. I love the art of arranging. It's just something that's always fascinated me. You know, N Nelson Riddle, who was Sinatra's primary arranger, is, is, is you know, I, I, I'm always just in awe of what he can do. You know, and film composers like John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, you know, who, who were just masters of, of sound, these, these, these huge ensembles, these huge orchestras, and the sounds that they created. That's what interests me. And so, and that's a big part of these 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 albums. And so, and that just comes down to me wanting to do do things that that I would, you know, make music that I would buy. Right. Well, I understand this has been a lifelong sort of love of yours. This style of music. I was reading that you have an encyclopedic. I didn't even know that was a word. An encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge of the twenties through the fifties in terms of this style of music. You talk about this big sound you were drawn to, but. You know, for a kid growing up in, let's say, the 80s, 90s, what do you think it was that really made you gravitate towards this music? I mean, I, you know, look, in, in some cases it was a movie. You know, I went to see Back to the Future, and that was my introduction to 50s music, and I, I started digging around in that world. I saw, I saw Radio Days, um, and that was a great introduction to 40s music and to big band music. And so I, I called my grandfather, and I said, yeah, you have more of this stuff? And he gave me a bunch of records. Um, <clears throat> and it was really just about exploring, uh, and you know, it it was it was really when I started listening to the the Sinatra ballad albums, like like Only the Lonely and We Small Hours and Where Are You, um, that I that I started really kind of realizing what what that stuff was really all about. That you you'd have like a minute long introduction from the orchestra before he even starts singing because. That's a big part of it, and and that that was the stuff that that only the lonely stands as what what might be it might be my favorite Sinatra record really um, because it's it's there, there's there's it's it's just the peak of arrangements as a key part of the uh, uh, the, the overall recording. Right. You mentioned We Small Hours, another yeah. Sinatra record. You've yeah. actually said that that's probably your favorite, or maybe you've said it's the greatest concept album. I think it, I think it is, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And your last album, too. It's years also sort ago, of, I think it's also the, sort of the first con concept album. I think you that can definitely was, argue that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, your last album, though, I want to get to this, is was largely inspired by that. It was made so almost as, I don't want to say in tribute to, but it was definitely, yeah. even the artwork kind of was a nod to, to Frank and, and the artwork to We yeah. Small Hours. But I'm curious, it's a very different sound than this record. This is a very joyous record, that more of a somber sound. I'm yeah. curious to ask you though, did that parallel at all with anything in your personal life? Is this a happier time for you in 2017 than 2015? I, I tend to, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to record um, albums based on, if, if you know, look, you, you're never gonna know how you're feeling at a certain point. You know, something great could happen in your life right when you're about to record an album of sad songs. Um, you know, luckily that I, I was kind of in sync with that record when I made it. I wasn't really in the happiest place, so it's it's it is um, it, it that that does help. So yeah, I mean, it, it that's in a perfect world. That's that is what you want. Right. Um, this this album is kind of up. I was sort of up when I when I recorded it. So I've I've been lucky as far as timing. Um, but yeah, but it, it is look. It's it's about creating a little movie in a lot of ways. I mean, it's like that that was the that was a brilliance of We Small Hours is that. You know, you, you had a culture that, you know, up to that point, um, for the most part was, you know, was, was um, you know, people recorded singles on 78s and, and suddenly here comes the LP and, you know, Sinatra and his team had sort of figured out how to turn that into, you know, how to write for that medium. So, you know, you write a movie differently than you'd write a TV show or a novel and, and, and you know, they sort of invented this idea of, of, I mean, it's basically a compilation with a consistent theme that then became the model for, for, you know, so many albums subsequently. Yeah, it's a really good point about those movie-esque LPs yeah. back then, really utilizing that format. You recorded this one, as you mentioned before, with about a 40 to 45 piece orchestra mm -hmm. out of Abbey Road Studios uh, yeah. in the UK. 
for someone that has a lot of control, whether you like it or not, over your work, someone whose voices, you know, take Family Guy, for instance, voices several different characters on that show, writes that show, created that show. Was it at all nerve wracking to sort of, I don't want to say uh, hand over uh, responsibility, but entrust 45 different musicians to really nail it. Because the way you recorded this is, if you don't know, kind of back in the day style where you go in three days or however long you were in Abbey, Studio, Abbey Road Studios, excuse me, and whatever you get is kind of what you get. You record it live. Was yep. that nerve wracking? It's just, it's just where you put the work in. You know, nowadays, so much of the work is done in post. And, you know, you, you go into the studio and then you noodle with it with the computer for God knows how long. And this is sort of the opposite. There's the, the work, so much of the work is done in prep, you know, from the writing of the arrangements to the casting of the musicians, which is underratedly one of the most important things. That, I mean, who those musicians are, who those players are, changes the whole record. Um, and there, there are certain, you know, we'll, we'll bring certain musicians from, you know, th the States with us over to the UK um, because we just have to have them. They're, they're yeah. Like nobody can play. No, nobody can play that particular solo like that particular player. Um, but, uh, but here, you know, everything from getting your pipes in shape for, you know, months or however long beforehand to the writing of the arrangements to the casting of the musicians it's all done beforehand, so when you get in the studio, um, you're you're ready to go, and it's it's almost like a live performance, and that's that's the fun of it. You know, you're you're it's it's not done with you know auto tune. It's not the it's it, it's it's all happening there, and it's and it's, a, it's you're capturing a moment in time, um, and and that's that to me is is a special thing, and it's unfortunately you know, getting rarer and rarer in, in the music business, but it's, it's, it's a pleasure. And it's, and it's, look, I mean, when I do a television show, the one thing, or a, or a movie, the one thing that I, the one point where I just sort of sit back and am relatively useless is when the composer is scoring. I don't have to direct, I don't have to write anything, I'm, I'm just there to watch. And I, I've talked to a lot of directors who say, like, that's their favorite part of the process, because they, they just hand it over. It's about relinquishing control to an artist, to a composer that you respect, yeah. um, and you know, it, it, in this case with the arrangements, it's the same thing. Joel McNeely is—I'm a huge fan of his. I've been a fan of his for years, and so when he presents me with an arrangement, it, that's part of the thrill. Is that this is somebody? This I, I my my hands are off. You right. Know? And when you you know, I love the way you have recorded this album because there is such a noticeable, tangible difference. It sounds like life. It sounds mm -hmm. like a living mm -hmm. body of work as opposed to, you know, you've alluded to the auto-tune stuff, the mm -hmm. post-production stuff. So it's nice to see, you know, at least in the jazz space right now, people making records like you do. Let's talk about the jazz space and these Grammy Awards. One of the Grammy nominations you're up for is Best Traditional Pop uh, Vocal. Now your competition, I don't know if you've looked at this, Bob Dylan and Tony Bennett. Is, yeah. that, is that as surreal to you <laughs> as it sounds? Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I mean, it's it it's surreal and it isn't. You know, like when when I look at when I look at how we put these records. I mean, you know, these guys are legends. But you know, back when they were, I mean, look, they're both still doing it all the time. But you know, we're we're procedurally we're making these records the same way that uh, Tony did and presumably still does. You know, I mean, he would get in there with the musicians and record and and do it live and and capture that moment in time. So, you know, within the context of that space, of those people, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's intimidating as hell, but at the same time, um, we, we don't feel, we're not phoning anything in. We don't feel like we're going in and, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll do this and we'll, we'll compete with these, you know, these juggernauts. No, we're, we're busting our asses and we're, we're really taking this as seriously as we possibly can. And and really trying to make something great, so it's intimidating, but it's also validating because we do feel good about the work. We right. do feel like we've really, really k killed ourselves to make this, you know, everything that it can possibly be. Right, and all that effort, by the way, abundantly comes through in the music because it does sound so good. Now the Grammys are taking place actually just down the road here in New York, which is pretty cool. Uh, last time they're here, I thought you'd be interested to know this. Your buddy Nora Jones, who appears on Info Swing, she was like the belle of the ball that night in 2003. She won Best New Artist that night. There's a famous picture of Nora with all the Grammys. Oh man, she deserves it. She's fantastic. Yeah, she, absolutely. The, the sweetest person and just a 
just a mega talent. That's I, I love hearing that. So my final question to you, Seth, is what would it mean? You've been up for a number of Grammys in the past. You've been nominated, uh, I believe, four times to date. What would it mean this year to win a Grammy? Well, you know, look, I mean, it, it's it's it would be it would be doubly valid. I mean, look, it's it's fantastic to be nominated, and if I go my whole life without ever winning, I still have these nominations, and that's more than I ever could have hoped for. Um, but it, it it would be massively validating. I mean, you know, again, we 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 travel. You know, we 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 travel halfway across the globe to to do these things, and and we spend all this time, you know, casting these musicians and working through these arrangements, and and really kind of creating each song as its as a as its own little storytelling piece. And so I. I on the one hand, it would be, uh, um, I, I would be flabbergasted and and overjoyed. But on the other hand, you know, part of me says, well, yeah, we put the work in. I mean, there's there's, we've we've worked as hard as anybody when they do something like this. It's not like because I come out of television that I'm given fifty percent. I mean, you know, we're 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 just we're we're trying to bring it in every way that we can. Absolutely. Well, best of luck on the big night. Again, the album In Full Swing, available everywhere now. Seth MacFarlane, Thank you. thanks for stopping by. <laughs>